First, the truth about investing. Most investors cannot see the future better than anybody else. And trying to predict the future will not produce investment success. My, one of my heroes, John Kenneth Galbraith, said, we have two kinds of forecasters, the ones who don't know, and the ones who don't know they don't know. The truth is, the future is uncertain, and yet, what is investing but deploying money for the future? Now, most investors act as if they can see the future, and they base their investment decisions on their view of the future. Either they think they can, or they think they have to pretend that they can for their business. Now, I think it's dangerous, because if it turns out that they really can't, as I believe, then, then there's a problem. There was a behaviorist named Amos Tversky at Stanford University, and he said something that I thought was brilliant. He said, it's frightening to think that you don't know something, but more frightening to think that, by and large, most people go around acting as if they do. We have an American humorist, Mark Twain, who said it even better. It's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for certain that isn't true. And this is extremely important. I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of keeping this in mind. If, you, if, you, if everything you say, as for me, if every sentence you say starts with the words, I may be wrong, but, or I don't know, but, then you're unlikely to get into trouble. The way you get into trouble is thinking that you really do know what the future holds, and of course, in my opinion, being wrong. Now, in our business, once in a while, somebody gets famous for a particularly brilliant prediction. But it usually turns out that they can't repeat that, and so I say that our business is full of people who got famous for being right once in a row. And of course, being right once in a row doesn't do any good because you never know if the next one has any value. But that's the way it is. And almost nobody is right much more than once in a row. And everybody in our business makes predictions of what's going to happen. And if you look at the great investors of the world, virtually none of them got famous by being able to predict the future of what we call macro. And when I'm talking about forecast today, I'm talking about the macro, economies, markets, currencies, uh, interest rates. These are the big picture factors. They're very important. Everybody would like to know what they imply, but they just can't. And uh, uh, Warren Buffett said to me one time, for a piece of information to be desirable, it has to satisfy two criteria. It has to be important, and it has to be knowable. And the macro is extremely important. And everybody says to me, how can you not base your investment approach on macro? It's so important. I say, yes, but it's not knowable. And if it's not knowable, then trying to base your approach on macro is really a waste of time or worse. Now, one of the main reasons for the difficulty of making predictions is the enormous influence of randomness. And, you know, things often, we know how it should go, but it, something else occurs instead. Impossible things happen all the time, and things that are extremely likely to happen fail to happen all the time. Now, let's go back in my country exactly two and a half years to November of 2016 there were two things that were considered certainties, not probable, certainties. Number one, Hillary Clinton would be elected president. And number two, if by some quirk of fate Donald Trump won, the market would collapse. And so instead, Trump won, and the market went straight up. And if that's not enough to convince people that they don't know what the future holds, then I don't think I can. But that's what happened. And uh, so nothing is more common 
than investors who are right for the wrong reason. And they get famous. But of course, we shouldn't follow them. That's the importance of randomness. I think that investors should accept the fact that they can't see the macro future and restrict themselves to doing the things that are within their power. These include gaining insight into what I call the knowables, companies, industries, and securities. And those are things where you can know more than the other person if you work hard and have skill and wisdom. And the other thing we can do is we can behave in what I call a contrarian or counter-cyclical way, and that's most of what I'll talk about this morning. How do you prepare for the future if you don't know it? And the answer is, we may not know what lies ahead, but we should understand where we are today and what that implies for the cycle. And I think it's, Im it's possible to improve investment results by making tactical decisions based on where we stand today and whether it calls for more aggressiveness or more defensiveness. And these decisions do not have to be made on the basis of guesses about the future. They can be made based on an understanding of the present. Where are we today? And what does that imply for the future? And what does that imply for how we should behave? So the thing that gets most people into trouble in investing is not the inability to see the future. It's the inability to control their own emotions. And we'll talk a lot about that today. Investors swing like a pendulum between fear and greed and optimism or pessimism, risk tolerance and risk aversion. And usually they swing in the wrong direction. And they warm to things as things go well and prices rise, and they get afraid as things go poorly and prices fall. And we want to try to do the opposite. Most investors behave pro-cyclically. They follow the cycle rather than anti-cyclical, as I will describe. And it's essential, in my opinion, to behave counter-cyclically. The cyclical ups and downs do not go on forever. Usually, if they feel like they will. They feel like there's either a virtuous circle that will make things go well forever, or a harmful circle that will make them go badly forever. But usually, that's not the case. Usually, we have ups and downs. And 45 years ago, somebody did me the favor of explaining to me, gave me the, the greatest gift, the greatest regalo, the three stages of the bull market. And if you understand this, you, you're almost ready to become a professional. The first stage, when only a few exceptionally bright people understand that there could be improvement. The second stage, when most people understand that improvement is actually taking place. And the third stage, when everybody believes that things will get better forever. So if you buy in the first stage, when most people don't see a better future, when there's very little optimism included in asset prices, you get a bargain. And you can make a lot of money. If you, do it in, if you buy in the second stage, when everybody understands that improvement is taking place, you don't get a bargain, you do OK, you follow the cycle, you buy in at a fair level. But if you buy in the third stage, when everybody thinks things will get better forever, and when asset prices reflect a great deal of optimism, you pay high prices, which set you up for substantial losses. So it, 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 the interesting thing about investing is it's not what you do, it's when you do it. It's not what you buy, it's when you buy it, under what conditions, and at what prices. So, the key to investing is not buying good things, it's buying things well. You have to understand the difference between a bueno and bien. <laughs> and it's buying bien that makes for success. When I started at Citibank, which was uh, uh, 
50 years ago this month, the bank bought the stocks of what were called the Nifty 50, the 50 best and fastest growing companies in America. Companies that were so terrific that it didn't matter what price you paid. That was the official theory. And they were selling at very high prices because they were such wonderful companies. And if you came in and you held them for five years, my first five years in the business, you lost almost all your money investing in the best companies in America. So buying high quality assets is not the key because they were buying in the third stage. The key is to understand where you are and to buy assets in the first stage and be careful in the third stage. That's a big part of today's message. So it's important to practice what is called contrarian behavior and to do the opposite of what others do at the extremes because the others are primarily wrong. Uh, and uh, there's a belief that things are safe when things are going well. Actually, that's the riskiest thing. The riskiest thing in the world is the belief that there's no risk, since this makes prices very high and sets the stage for bad experiences. We must sell when others are buying most aggressively and buy when they're selling most aggressively. And Buffett says it great as usual. He says, the less prudence with which others conduct their affairs, the greater the prudence with which we must conduct our own affairs. When other people are unafraid and forcing prices high, we must be cautious. When other people are terrified and selling and pushing prices down, we should turn aggressive. And it's, it's, it's that, that's the bottom line, uh, of course, if only it was that simple. <laughs>